Hi there, just a little quick video. Uh, what you see here is my TRS-80 Coco 2 or Color Computer 2. You know, it was a Radio Shack inexpensive computer released kind of in the 80s. There was a first generation and the second. I'm using it with this Sony TV because unfortunately the Coco 2 only supports uh, RF output, channel 3, channel 4 kind of thing. So there's no composite. But anyways, um, I wanted to show off a little cool thing I got for this computer. It's this. It's some software that turns it into an audio spectrum analyzer. It's actually a cartridge, and a friend of mine recently got some old TRS-80 Coco parts and manuals and stuff, and he gave this to me as part of the lot he got because it was all covered in mildew and mold, and he just didn't want to sell it because it was not going to be worth selling, so we passed it on, and I actually cleaned this up, and um, I wanted to kind of show you a little bit about what this does. When you put the cartridge in and you boot it up, you get this little splash screen here. So Audio Spectrum Analyzer by Steve Bjork, copyright 1981, Datasoft Incorporated. We're not quite sure how to skip this. Oh, I guess you just hit enter. And you end up with this little screen here. So of course, we've all seen graphical spectrum analyzers. If you remember during the 80s, you could have a stereo component for your audio system that might show you the audio spectrum of whatever you were playing music. but in my 8-bit era, when the computers I had, so around this time in the early 80s, I was using a Commodore VIC-20, and then my next computer was an Apple II Plus, and then I had an Apple IIc, and none of them could do anything like this. This is 1981. So I do have the manual like you saw, but I'm just going to kind of skip forward to how this works. You put the cartridge in, you use the cassette interface software, and you plug an audio device into it. And here I have a phone. So let's go over here to a frequency generator here. We hit play. And what's cool is the audio actually comes out of the phone. I have it kind of going through a cable that connects it to this, uh, the black jack on this cable. And the audio comes through the TV and it's generating 366 Hertz on the phone. And you can see here it's about 250, but let's uh, alter this on the phone. So here, I'm gonna just type in a thousand Hertz. There we go, 1,000 hertz. Let's change this to 2,000 hertz. 2,000, 8,000. Yeah, how cool. Um, totally works. It even goes all the way down to these low ranges. Let's see, let's put in uh, 63 hertz. Can't even hear it because the cheap speaker on this TV can't reproduce that kind of frequency, but there it is, 63 hertz. Let's try 31.5, well, I'll put in 32. Okay, nothing. So that could be that this cheap ass phone, this is a, this phone was cost $130, it's made by Blue. It may not even support that kind of low frequency out of this headphone jack. But as you saw, the uh, 65 hertz, or 63 hertz works perfectly. Okay, so it does work. Let's uh, hit stop on this. And I have queued up on YouTube some royalty free music. Hit play. And there it is, it's working. So the Apple II had a headphone, or had a basically it looked like a headphone in jack, but it was actually to hook up a cassette player. It was sort of like how this you know, has this cable, um, but it was just built in the computer. And I remember, I'm turning the volume down a little bit, let's turn down the TV here. I remember that I had some software that would kind of make some graphics on the screen that would react to whatever audio you put into the computer. It was low resolution Apple II graphics, which is the very blocky stuff, but it definitely was nothing like a spectrum analyzer. I mean, this is actually doing what, like a fast Fourier transformation on the input audio signal. So it's able to actually show you like which frequency bands are being used. The Apple II thing was very rudimentary and it just sort of do sort of kaleidoscopy stuff. It barely matched up with what was, you know, on the input signal. But I guess the Coco, you know, this machine is pretty old, but it's pretty powerful. It's running that Motorola 6809 processor. I think it's got more power than a 6502. And even though it has that really Mickey Mouse kind of green background 
user interface and very cheap feeling keyboard, uh, clearly it's able to do an FFT. And this cartridge, from the best of my understanding, has absolutely no other function than just to do this. Um, but I do find it pretty awesome that it's actually able to route the audio input, which is on the cassette jack, usually used for loading basic programs, through the TV's audio. So that's really cool. But yeah, I just wanted to share uh, with you guys that this exists, and I had never particularly seen this. Radio Shack cat number 26-3158, or 56, sorry, it's hard to read that. And um, I know if I was a kid and I had this cartridge when I was seven years old, I would have been blown away and totally in love with this. I want to show you guys the manual as well. As you can see, this whole cartridge has been subjected to a ton of water. It was in the original box. I threw it away it was because it was completely disintegrated. But these staples have actually even rusted away. And you can see the mildew and everything on here. But let's just uh, check this out. To the audio purist, high fidelity is a term which means faithful sound reproduction. The sound of being there. I mean, this is just silly. But yeah, it's talking about how it's doing it in ISO standard frequencies at one third octave points, center frequencies. The bars are calibrated in decibels, a reference to a suitable audio level input. The measurement level extends from minus 20 dB to plus five. I have no idea how accurate the, and how flat the audio response is of this circuitry. I mean, it's designed for data coming in off the cassette player. I, I, I don't know. I mean, you can see here there's a lot of this going up here in the high frequency and not a lot down here because I think this is probably where it's most, uh, when it's recording data, or getting data off the tape, this is the area where it's being used, not this this low stuff. But um, yeah, it sort of explains here how to hook it up and it does say use the black jack on the he headphone cord, not the headphone cord, on the uh, cassette here. And to use a low level source, um, you might need an amplifier like the Radio Shack something or other. Startup, real time. Oh, oh, there's a mode. You can push F. Let's restart that song. Hmm. Press F for fast real time response peak mode to show the instantaneous energy. Press S for slow average. Oh, I get it. Okay. So you see how slow the bars are if I pause? Let me hit F. It's much faster. Okay, so a couple modes. Um, oh, press D for detail. Ah, look at that. Interesting. Um, peak and hold. Oh, peak and hold. Okay, press P. Well, that's weird. So clearly it's because I was sweeping the frequency. How do you reset? You can reset by pushing R. <laughs> well, that's cute. Freezing the display. Press the space bar to freeze the display. All right, so you can freeze it. And there's uh, some stuff. Oh, there's a kaleidoscope mode. Press K. Oh, and you can you can turn the audio on and off. So A turns the audio off. That's odd. I push A. It doesn't actually turn the audio back on. Turned it off, but that's it. So K for kaleidoscope. Nice. Okay, so this is a lot more like what my Apple II was able to do, although I really swore that it didn't really do much that responded to actually what was coming into the audio. But yeah, and that's it. Kaleidoscope graph on. G for graph. Goes back. Oh, and now the A turned the sound back on. So K for... Anyhow... There we go. Coco doing a spectrum analyzer with that cartridge. Pretty awesome. Thanks for watching. If you found this interesting at all, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and uh, subscribe for more videos and put your comments down in the section below. Let me know if you've ever used something like this. And if so, what did you think about it back in 1981? Okay, bye.